right, I think all of our, I think all, everyone's here, all right? So why don't we go ahead and get started? So we are officially live. Welcome everyone to Stripe Dev Live. Um, this might be a little bit different from some of the other ones we've done before, if you've been on a Stripe Dev Live before. Generally, we usually do these on Discord, but we said, hey, why not try something new and different and try it on the Twitter space? So if you all like this type of format, if you think this is pretty cool and we should do more of these, let us know after this conversation and we can definitely talk about that. But uh, today, I'm really excited about this conversation because I think we're going to be talking about something that's very near and dear to a lot of us and, and something that has like a lot of deep emotional roots. And our panel today is a group of amazing developer advocates across a lot of different companies. And they're going to be talking this about some of the struggles that they've experienced and are even still going through as they're doing their day-to-day -day job. And so I want to start off with really quickly, uh, I'm just going to call out everyone and have them introduce themselves and then, uh, and then we'll dive into our conversation. So James, why don't we start with you? Yeah, what's going on, everyone? Um, I, from a developer advocate perspective, I'm a developer advocate at a company called PlanetScale. Before that, I was a developer advocate at All Zero, and then I actually started my career as a technical evangelist, which is a more, a little bit older term for basically the same type of thing uh, at Microsoft. And I usually talk about three things that I do. I'm a developer, speaker, and teacher, and I've done some combination of those things professionally for about 10 years now. Awesome, thank you, James. I uh, appreciate you being here. And Brian Clark. Hey everyone, thanks for having me. And uh, my name is Brian Clark. I'm a developer advocate at Sneak. Uh, prior to that, I was at Microsoft, and then I was at Disney as an engineering role um, before that. And uh, yeah, happy to talk about the struggles of being a developer advocate. <laughs> awesome. Uh, Rizal, what about you? You want to go next? Yeah, sure. Uh, hey, everyone. My name is Rizal. I'm a developer advocate at GitHub. I'm pretty new to developer advocacy. I've been uh, here for like about 10 months before that i was a software engineer at like random startups that no one's ever heard of um and like everybody else i'm super excited to like just rant about the struggles of being a developer advocate oh i believe there will be a lot of ranting happening today that's for sure um jay why don't you go next one yeah sure um hey i'm jay miller i'm a senior cloud advocate at microsoft before that, I was a developer advocate at Elastic, um, and I've been in the industry for a couple of years. Uh, but before that, I was creating content, mostly podcasting, uh, for about, I think it's been eight years now. So uh, well aware of the industry, but didn't know how to get in until a few years ago. And uh, happy to, to talk about that, uh, as well as some other struggles. Oh, awesome. And I guess I'll jump in too. Like, so my name is Cecil Phillip for folks that, that may not know me. Um, I'm also a developer advocate. Uh, I've been in the industry for about 13 years and spent, I want to say like the last five of those in advocacy, you know, work with developers and, you know, creating content and things of that nature. And, you know, one of the things that I love about this panel of folks that we have is that I feel like everyone has a completely different level of experience in terms of like, how they do their job, how they got into advocacy in the first place, and, and how they kind of think about like advocacy as a discipline within like the developer community too. So I'm really interested in hearing what these folks have to say. And then also for folks that are listening, um, definitely feel free to go ahead and ask questions, raise your hand. We'll try and get you in and get some of your questions answered as we, we have this, this, uh, this discussion. So I wanna start off with this question, because um, I think this is kind of kind of lead into some of the other things that we wanna talk about. And that is, what does advocacy mean to you? Like, what does what does developer advocacy actually mean? And and Rizal, why don't we start off with you? Like, I'd love to hear what your take is on that question. Okay, cool. Uh, I guess advocacy means to me, um, just empowering developers as they use your product. Like, I want to make sure as a as a developer advocate that people are not confused on how to use the product, that they feel excited to use the product. Um, and that it's just enabling them to do what they need to do, what they do best, which is their job. Um, yeah, I think to me, that's, that's developer advocacy, listening to the, the user, making sure, and the user being the developer, making sure that they can, they can succeed as developers. 
Nice. And Brian, what about you? I'd love to hear about what you think advocacy is and even to what what made you decide to get into advocacy in the first place? Oh, you're going to hit me with the double question now, huh? <laughs> well, I got to give you extra work to do because, you know, I know I know you can handle it. Uh, no, I think Rizal hit it uh, spot on. Um, and yeah, like the, the only thing I would, I guess, add to that is, you know, part of being a developer advocate to me is being able to be your authentic self and everything like that, not necessarily have to, um, cause at times, depending on who you're collaborating with at your, your company, maybe they're in sales or, or whatever that they, they're going to want you to approach things a certain way. And you have to kind of push back and be like, well, that's not how I would share these things with developers, or I don't believe that that would be of interest to a developer and so forth. So being authentic and, uh, organic, I mean, approaching things organically and not forcing things is, uh, the one little thing I would add to what, what Rizal already talked upon. And then what was that second question again? How did, how did I get into DevRel or De developer yeah. advocacy? Right? Yeah. Like, what made you decide to, to get into it? Yeah. So, I mean, as I was, uh, doing more engineering related when I was in my engineering role, um, I really just found myself enjoying, um, learning new things and then sharing what I learned with other colleagues. So it started small with like just certain people on my immediate team, like maybe a, a close friend that I made on my team and like saying, Hey, this is this cool thing I learned about. And then that slowly expanded to doing more like lunch and learns and then like doing my first time speaking at an internal conference. And I found myself just gravitating more and more towards activities like that. And then an opportunity arose where I could get paid for that. And I was like, heck yeah, I'm going to jump in on that opportunity. I mean, I was totally happy and I, I foresaw myself, you know, living the rest of my life in that engineering role, even at that original company. Um, but I, I saw it as like, this is, I need to challenge myself maybe and like see and pursue this further since I'm already feeling, finding myself gravitating towards those things. And, uh, and that's where, that's what led me to, to where I'm at now. You know, what? Some of my friends, some of my non-technical friends ask me what I do for a living. I like to tell them I'm a, I'm a teacher that teaches developers how to do stuff, right? Because um, I kind of look at developer advocacy as, as an education first kind of role. You know what I mean? And it's education on both sides, right? That we have to educate the company as to what developers need and what, what the temperature of the room kind of is. And, but then also, too, we have to educate our, um, our communities about, look, again, these products and practices and those types of things that, you know, we're obviously doing for the different companies, right? Do you, all, do you all agree with that? Do you think that makes sense? I think there was a tweet a while back. It was like, well, maybe it was you actually that sent that tweet out. It was like, what, what's going to happen in 20 years when all these developer advocates decide, you know what, I'm, I think I'm done with tech. Uh, I think someone was like, oh man, high school teaching is, is probably the next, that's like the retirement career path for us. And honestly, I feel it like, some of the most fun that I've had in this role is speaking to students, speaking to college students, even speaking to high school students. Um, and for me, that was because I didn't know what I'm doing today was a job when I was their age. So I want to have opportunities to expose them to those types of careers because one, right now I think kids these days are just given all of the, the world of social media and things around them and how they navigate it and how they navigate it so fluently, I think that it puts them in such an advantageous position for the future of DevRel. But that being said, no one's talking about that, you know, on career day at high school, in high school. So for me, I love the idea of teaching, but I also love the idea of exposing new career opportunities and ideas to that next generation. Yeah, I agree with that 100%. Uh, it looks like, Christos, looks like, I want to try and get you on. Uh, I think Christos has a question. This approve oh, button is not working for me. <laughs> While you're doing that, I wanted to add really quickly on the the concept of people not knowing that DevRel, developer relations, by the way. So there's developer advocate as a job, developer relations is usually a team. But DevRel being an opportunity that people don't know about. And this is 100% the truth for me coming out of college. I applied for Microsoft for a regular software development job that I didn't get, applied for another role, didn't get it. And then they were like, what do you think about uh, technical evangelists? I was like, I don't know, but this is Microsoft, so sure. And that's like, it's really sad 
but the reality is that's where the majority of the jobs are. It's just like traditional software engineering, but DevRel is growing more and more and people are seeing more about what DevRel can do and they're getting hired on earlier at companies. And so I think that visibility of this being an option is continuing to grow, which is really exciting. Yeah, I agree with you. Crystal, so I think you're online. Did you have a question you wanted to ask the folks? Yep. Yeah. Hey, guys. Um, I've been a developer advocate for three years, officially and unofficially for eight years. Uh, it's probably one of the most fun and exciting jobs in, in anyone's tech career. So if you get a chance to do it, do it. I would say for most people that have done developer advocacy, how do you find um, rewards and getting recognized for the work that you do? Because advocating to developers is fantastic, especially when you have a large audience. But how do you take that and make it measurable so you can go back to your manager and show the impact? Yeah, I agree with you. And and I think that's a good segue, right? Like, let's let's kind of start diving into what some of these struggles that we do have as developers, developer advocates are. Um, I know this actually kind of started with an article that James wrote. James Quick wrote an article called Top Five Struggles of a Developer Advocate. And, you know, we had a conversation and we thought this would be a really great Twitter space because I'm sure there's tons of folks that are in advocacy or trying to get into advocacy that would love to, you know, hear what other people's experiences are. And, you know, kind of like what Christos mentioned, like one of the big things that I think all of us experience as advocates is trying to figure out, well, how do we measure success, right? Like, how do we know that we're doing a good job? How do we know that we're doing the right job? And, and not only how do we know that we're doing a good job, but how do we let our, you know, our leadership team know that we're doing a good job as well? Um, and so, James, why don't I pass it to you? And maybe you could talk about that for a little bit. Yeah, I'll do a slightly different take. So I think like especially in the article that Rizal wrote after mine, she touched on like the metrics are tough and I think that's a consistent thing. So I'm sure everyone will have more to talk about there. But I also want to talk about the like raising awareness for what you're doing. And this is something that I've significantly struggled with in my career and especially at my time at Microsoft where it was my first job out of college and I felt like I was doing as impactful of events and activities as anyone else, especially with my level of experience. And for the first year that worked really well, second year, I didn't get, it's not the recognition for like making me feel good. It was like end of year reviews didn't match up with what I thought I had done, like the level that I thought I performed at. And I realized that people around me that were getting more recognition and just people were more aware of their activities were more comfortable talking about themselves. And at the time, like I was kind of turned off by this idea because I was like, I don't feel like like, I don't, I don't need to talk about myself all the time. That's just not naturally who I am. But that also is part of, in any career, but especially in DevRel, is being able to craft that story about the impact that you have. And we can get into, like, what metrics do you track specifically and all those things. But oftentimes it comes down to, like, how well can you tell the story of the impact? And some of that is, like, I had a one-on-one conversation with an individual developer, and they went on to do this. That's, like that's as impactful as speaking to a room full of a hundred people at a conference, or it can be depending on how you phrase it. So I think a lot of us feel really uncomfortable, not bragging, but like we feel like we're bragging by talking about ourselves and our accomplishments. And I think one of the things that you kind of have to step outside of, or kind of have to force yourself to be a little uncomfortable is just becoming more comfortable talking about yourself. Cause otherwise like it's the tree falls in the forest. Does it make a sound type thing? If no one's around, Like you're not, no one's going to know unless you tell that story. So the further you progress in your career, hopefully you can push yourself to be a little bit more comfortable to take control of that narrative and feel more comfortable sharing your story with people and do that in a way that hopefully two other people into yourself doesn't feel like you're going out of your way to brag about the work that you're doing. Yeah, Brian, you got your hand up? Yeah, I just, I felt really strongly about what James just shared and I, 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 I don't know. I I tend to over index onto the side of, um, you know, being, I have a strong aversion towards talking highly of myself in general. And I over index on that a bit, but I quickly learned a hard lesson from this because I I was of, of the mentality that like my work will speak for itself and I should just naturally get recognized for that work because like, I don't, I don't, I shouldn't have the need to talk about it. Right. That just people should be good about that. But the reality is like, you're, your leader is they have their own responsibilities and they're busy with their own things at times. And 
while they would love to be able to see everything that you do and all the impact you have, you have to make note of it and bring that up and shed light on it um, because it's just not really possible for somebody. So it's, it still feels awkward to me and I'm actively working on getting better about doing that. Um, but I've quickly learned, especially in this role that it's, it's a necessity. Yeah, I definitely agree with what both of you all said. Um, I know prior to, prior to me being a, like a professional advocate, you know, I used to do a podcast and one of the things I hated in that podcast was I hated having to listen to myself, which is kind of weird, right? Considering that you're doing a podcast, but even that to say like, oh, wow, I, you know, we did a really good job at this interview or we did a really good job at interviewing this person. Like I refused to listen to it after the recording was done. Cause I'm like, I was there. I know what happened. I'm done. <laughs> I'm going to walk away from it because it gives me like this level of anxiety. You know, and I'm sure a lot of us that probably do videos and do other forms of media probably feel the same way too, right? Because this job is such a public facing job. And then sometimes like that emotion and that anxiety kind of gets to us. And we're like, I hope people like it, but I also am a little afraid to hear what the response is going to be like. You know what I mean? And so we kind of have to try and balance those emotions a little bit as we're trying to figure out, well, you know, how can I best do my job, right? And how can I best achieve what I'm trying to do? Uh, Rizal, your hands up. I'm gonna let you jump in. Yeah, I actually have a question because um, y'all are more experienced than me. But first, I want I have like a little context. So like I'm similar to what you're saying, Cecil. Like I I'm I'm kind of more of a shy person, and I didn't even really consider developer advocacy until I started um, teaching other women of color. And I was like, oh wait, this is kind of cool. I thought I'd be more scared of like speaking in front of people, but I like it. And I'm the same where I don't really want to re-listen to myself because my voice doesn't sound anything like I, what I thought it was. Um, but my question to y'all is like, how do you tastefully or like in a good way keep telling people about the work you're doing? Because I feel like I'm annoying. Like I feel like I'm posting in Slacks, posting in Twitter. I'm like, hey, I made more content and I don't want to like um, clog up everybody's feed but I still want people to be able to recognize my work so that I'd be able to advance in my career. Yeah, I'll jump in real quick and then um, I'll, let, I'll let some of our Arnold panel folks um, talk about it. But the way that I approach the job is I try, to, I try to put authenticity first in front of everything else. And when I say that, I mean, hey, if I, if I really like this product or if I really like this programming language or this thing that I'm working on, like I wanna generally show my learning experience as I'm going through it, if that makes sense. Versus, oh, hey, I'm just, like, I'm not a Ruby person. I'm going to start posting in, like, Ruby forums. I'm not a, you know, TypeScript person. Whatever. I'm going to start posting TypeScript forums. But, hey, I'm generally interested in learning about, I don't know, maybe serverless and microservices. And so now I really want to, in, in, you know, in, um, embed myself in those communities and not just be there to, to, to give stuff but also receive as well, right? Like it has to be like a symbiotic relationship that, you know, I'm learning from the community and they're learning from me as well. And now we can kind of share a little bit. And that for me makes me feel a little bit more authentic when I do it versus me being like, oh, hey, we're doing a thing today or there's a particular event that happens. I, you know, I drop a tweet or a post and I disappear. And then, you know, we move on to the next thing. Uh, Jay, I see you got your hand up. Um, I, I want to you know, echo some of the thoughts that Rizal had. Um, I mean, the, the lived experience for a, a lot of, you know, Black kids with anxiety growing up is often I'm not worth listening to. And the things that I have to say aren't valid. And that is something that I struggle with to this day. Like, I, I think probably one of the things that most of us on this panel have had are people have come to us and said like, Hey, I love what you're doing. And the, the feeling there is often, but, but what am I doing? Like what, what, what am I doing that makes me feel so valuable to you? If you're, you know, an employer or to the community and you know, when we talk, when James is talking about the idea of, you know, sharing those things, and Rizal was talking about almost feeling as if you are annoying people uh, with, with the idea of let me share everything, let me tell everybody everything that I'm doing. 
I think sometimes we have to do that for ourselves as well to show like, oh, wait, no, I, I am out here actually doing something. I am out here making a commitment to, you know, this community, but I'm also like working with my company as well. Like I'm showing value to my company, but I'm also showing value to the community at the same time because when we don't see that, when we don't see that value, we immediately start getting into our head. And as, as you know, James's first line in his blog post of like, anxiety is real and like am i doing a good job if, if we don't have that validation and that feedback loop we don't think we are and i think a lot of that comes from the anxiety of, of doing this job but also some of the lived anxieties that we have just growing up yeah i love the i mean i love the honesty and transparency all the way around because this is i feel like devrel has always been or a developer advocate has always been one of those positions that like seem celebrity like just because it's like usually a person that you see on youtube or at a conference or whatever um so i appreciate this whole thing but the one one thing i'll add that has just been like somewhat devrel specific and, and mainly just life is like typically we will always be the ones that fail to recognize our own value um and some of that is just like based on a lot of different experiences some of that is just not taking the time to actually think about the impact that we have. And my wife and I talk about this a lot. Like someone, someone will come up to us similar to what you said, Jay, and say like, Oh, so impressive that you did X, Y, or Z, whatever it is. And we're like, well, that's just like, that's part of my job. But the reality is like, Devrel is a very specific set of skills that is not very common. Like this idea of being social enough, being able to create content, being able to get up in front of an audience and talk, being able to do that from a technical perspective where you don't lose trust and you earn people's respect is a really, really tough set of skills. And like, if you're in that position, there's already something there. And one of the things I encourage people to do, including myself, like all the advice that I give other people is stuff that I continually try to work on is take that time out to think about what it is that you've done and what you've accomplished and why that's valuable because we often overlook it. And the, the sharing aspects, like the, and the lack of validation, the one, one other thing I'll add is, just to try to have open conversations with manager and peers uh, to say, like, do you think I'm sharing enough? Do you think I'm sharing too much? Do you think I'm doing a good job? Like, don't be afraid to ask for that feedback and use that as something that you can act on. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And one thing I would love to add to that is, you know, for a lot of us, you know, a lot of us have way different experiences, you know, in terms of tenure and even companies that we've worked for. And sometimes we can be in a position where like we ask for feedback internally and like we just don't get it right or you know we don't we don't we don't get like the detail of information that we needed to know whether we're doing a good job or not and then that also too can cause a lot of anxiety right like when you're not getting from your leadership like the the communication right and like the clear instructions about what exactly is expected of you or how well you're doing then that too could give you like a sense of like uncertainty and so for me, like when, whenever that's happened in the past, like I look out to my community, right? Like usually the community or folks in other departments or whatever would say, hey, you're doing a good job. This was really helpful. You know, this this made me feel um, way better because it, it made me feel like I'm not wasting my time just like doing random things for for, for what like for what point? You know what I mean? Um, and I think that, too, also kind of leads into another conversation that I, I, I kind of want us to dive into. And inside of advocacy, like we all have a tons of different like responsibilities and different things to focus on. Like, how do you choose what you focus on? Like, how do you choose this is the thing right now that we're going to put our time in? And why don't I start with Jay? Jay, I see you got your hand up, man. So why don't you, you take that question first? I, I want to say uh, I don't choose things. They choose me. Um, and I, I mean that in almost full honesty of having ADHD and just understanding that I will go down certain paths. And sometimes the answer is just, you got to go down that path until you hit a dead end and then go somewhere else. Um, it, it really does feel that way at times. And I think that that is, that is a struggle of, you know, I, I think I tweeted about this the other, the other week, like one of my favorite lines uh, in any really long monologue 
on a on a record is the last lines of camp from Donald Glover and he talks about like I, I got on the bus a boy and I never got off the bus. Uh, and and then like the start of the next album is talking about sometimes you just gotta get off the bus. So that that to me is very much the feeling of like I will find something and it will just it will just crawl into my brain and I'll be thinking about it all day. I'm like I, I gotta I gotta chase this itch. I gotta figure it out and um hopefully it, like I think that the way that you can usually help to off ramp that is like open communication. I think a lot of the answers here are gonna be open communication. Talk, talk to your bosses, talk to your colleagues, like, does anybody else have this problem? Is it okay if I, is it okay if I go down this road for a little bit? And then from there, like, once, it, once it's been co-signed on, you're like, cool, all right, let's, let's dive into this, let's build this, let's make it work. You know, Jay and I were just talking really quickly, and I was asking the question, you know, what happens when you get assigned to do, like, a job or a project or, you know, work on a product you know, from an advocacy perspective, but you're just, you're just not interested in it, right? Like you don't have the passion or, you know, you're not, you know, you're not interested in learning that topic, right? Like, what do you do? And I'm going to jump into, like, Jay, you were talking about it, right? So do you want to chime in really quick? Uh, only if I can share some advice that I got from my big brother in the industry, a guy named Cecil Phillip. Uh-uh. Um, <laughs> you know, I one of the things that I love about the industry is we have there's a lot of mentorship that happens and being able to have conversations with people and have open conversations and be like, yo, I'm really struggling with this right now. And uh the advice that I got was sometimes you just gotta burn through it. Like make the thing, get the thing done. Um invite people to collaborate to make it better uh, i definitely will, will always say like it's it's so much easier to uh bear with the process if you have other people bearing with you versus you trying to take it all on your own uh, but i i think that tech in general is so flexible that we often can find a way to to make even some of the most just dry topics interesting and I think that's like you have to in sometimes find a way to say, oh, this thing is kind of dry, kind of boring. But what if we what if we took a new spin on? What if we remixed it and, and turned it into something that looks at a, a traditionally dry topic with a little bit more uh, interest and flair to it? So, Rosal, I know you're you're like the freshest advocate out of the panel that's here. What, is, what has that experience been like for you? like choosing what projects to work on or being told what projects to work on and then having to, you know, find the energy and the motivation to do things that sometimes you don't want to do? Yeah, I mean, I'm a pretty, ex- like, you can get me excited about, like, anything. You can be like, you have to write about something really boring and I'll be like, yeah, let's do it. Um, especially when I first started um, in developer advocacy, just because I was just so excited that I had this job. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm, like, excited and ready to do everything. Um, so, like, I essentially tried out different media formats, different topics, and, like, that helped me to figure out the things I don't like to do. Like, for example, my team is, like, really big on, like, creating YouTube shorts and TikToks, and I'm I'm just, like, not, I don't like doing it. Um, it's not fun for me. Um, so, what I ended up doing, like, I tried it out, um, and I just kind of told Brian, like, I don't like doing this as much. Um, And he was like, that's fine, especially because I found different ways to still show my value. Like, my team wasn't creating as many blog posts as me, so I would just, like, put out mad blog posts. And it's like, okay, that's okay because, like, you're offsetting it with that. And then if there's, like, topics I don't really like as much, I usually try to think of, like, how would I have made this exciting for myself, like, if I was the learner? And that makes me, like, more engaged and interested while I'm, like, creating that content or learning that topic. Um, But there are times where, like, I, for example, I know, like, co-pilot's a little bit of a a controversial topic. I don't really um, always want to to talk about certain topics like that. Um, But I'm, I'm trying to find ways to do it in a way that's, like, less controversial or, um, changes their perspective a little bit so yeah that i kind of rambled but those are my thoughts 
No, that totally makes sense. James, you got your hand up? Yeah, I love that. Um, one interesting thing about me in full transparency, I've gotten the feedback before, which I think is completely appropriate that like, if it's not something that I already believe in, that I kind of shut it down too fast. So this is from Sam Jolene, who's a uh, director of Devrel Law Zero. And I shout him out because this is like really valuable piece of feedback. And I think it's definitely true. It's something I have to balance with, but I also have this perspective of like, as much as possible, why would I spend time doing something if it's not something that I'm excited about? Now, there's obviously a balance, right? Like you have to do things sometimes that you're not excited about, but I think everyone's first approach should be like either how can I do less of the thing that I'm not excited about or something kind of similar to what's been said, like how do I turn this thing into something that I am more excited about? And I had a conversation recently with my current VP of like talking about transitioning some of the content that we're doing and me just being honest of like, I, I don't know if one, that's not something that I'm excited about, but also I don't know that I think that's the best use of my time for these reasons. And I'm kind of curious, like, I still think there's probably a little bit more of a conversation for us to have on that. And I definitely had to fight that balance of pushing back too early while also considering like, this is an opportunity for myself to do something different. Um, but the, the output of that is like, just by having the conversation and being honest and giving a reason for why I think something else would be a better use of my time. Um, being able to basically run with that idea instead, while also keeping in mind, like I have this thing that I would rather do, but also having to translate that back to the reason that you wanted me to do this other thing, the thing we were trying to accomplish or do better at. I think I can push that needle cliche thing, but I think I can impact that thing better by doing it this way. So I think just having the conversation, always starting with an approach of like things that we do should be fun. I, I have worked with plenty of people who just accept that everything in the world sucks and that's the way it's going to be. And that's not the kind of person that I want to be. But there is that balance of like making sure that you're being a team player, that you're open to ideas and then uh, figuring out what the best way to capitalize on that is. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. Like it's always about a good balance, right? And for folks that are listening, like, we definitely don't want to make it sound like, oh, developer advocates are a bunch of divas that only want to work on stuff they want to work on. But I think there's also the point that a part of our job is to get our communities and other developers and industry excited about the things that, you know, that we're showing you, right? Like whether we're talking about like a new programming language feature, a cloud thing, or I don't know, whatever, whatever product it is we're working on. Like our job is to get you excited about it. And if we're not excited about it, it's very hard to be, you know, not our authentic selves to go out and kind of push that, right? Like that's, you know, that's very disingenuous, right? And so that's why it's important for us to believe in the things that we're talking about. Because if we truly believe it, then, you know, you'll see the authenticity in our videos and our content and the things that we create. And it wouldn't feel like a forced process. Uh, Brian, I see you got your hand up. Yeah, I, I don't have much more to add because you all hit on the things that were going through my mind. Balance, being team player. Uh, the, the one thing I wanted to add about, uh, you know, choosing what, what you like to work on versus what you don't like to work on. I think in, whether you're a dev advocate or you're an engineer, or you're in any career, as you kind of progress on, you start learning more about yourself and what you enjoy doing. And not to get all, you know, like philosophical or anything like that, but like you you know, you only have so much time in your life and your job that you're doing. So you want to spend and capitalize as much time of that doing the things you enjoy doing. Um, and so I think that's the, the, the driver behind a lot of this at times. But again, all this stuff that you all said already plays into it too. So it's just, it's not necessarily doing that a hundred percent of the time it's balancing and, and supporting a team players. Like the biggest thing that comes to mind to me is like, I will suck it up and just do what needs to be done because we want to win the game. We want to have the impact on developers in our company. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. And uh, Jesse, I saw you. We uh, we just uh, let you in, man. So you had a question or something you wanted to add to the conversation? Yeah, I just wanted to add in. And uh, super cool conversation here, by the way. Uh, but one of the topics, too, about for develop developer advocacy is a great question is why am I not excited about that? So when there are these really dry topics, I mean, listicles are still listicles <laughs> at the end of the day. But like if there's a topic where you're like, man, I just can't get behind this. Um, that's totally an opportunity to, to actually look into it and say, 
um, yeah, like what is it I don't understand about this and why, why it's meaningful for the space that I'm in. And maybe it's an opportunity to learn and actually, you know, stretch out into a new, new category. I have a, a question kind of playing off of that. Um, one of the things that I feel as a driver in our careers is the ability to communicate and, and I guess, I don't want to say influence, but like speak to other advocates about being an advocate. And I'm not going to lie. Like, I love these conversations because it talks about, like, the hard part. I don't like trying to tell other people how to do what they're doing because, honestly, you do you has gotten me pretty far in life. But I, I want to pose that question as kind of, a, like, how do you find excitement to do that thing that is, like, a career mover like most of us like we network with each other i think everyone here um on the panel is either currently or has currently worked at a company <laughs> you know at the same company uh, maybe in different times so it shows that it's a small world and people knowing each other is a thing but how do you find the excitement to in to just engage with one another professionally like is is just that you know the I call it the ice cream parlor because not everybody goes to the bar. There's like just congregating at the ice cream parlor or you know grabbing dinner after a conference or whatever, just connecting with each other in a space. Is that enough? And if it's not, how do you push yourself over the edge to do more? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I can tell you for me, like people excite me, right? Like being able to learn from other people and and soak up knowledge from them for me is always really exciting. So sometimes, you know, I'll be in a position where I'll give you an example, like in a past life, I used to work on a product that dealt with taxes. I'll be honest with you, taxes isn't the most riveting thing to, to want to talk about, at least not for me. But at the time, I did have the opportunity to create and work on some software that I thought was really interesting. So like the technology was interesting to me and how we were solving the problem was interesting to me. You know what I mean? The problem itself wasn't that interesting, but like how we saw that was interesting. And so I'm bringing it up because sometimes you have to find angles around to get the job done. You know what I mean? Like, so I don't know, maybe you don't care about metrics or maybe you don't care about like, you know, open telemetry or AI or whatever the case is. But hey, I do might get the opportunity to work with some cool people. I might get the opportunity to get some new skills. I might get the opportunity to get in front of a different audience of people that I haven't done before. And that might be the interesting part about it. And maybe that's how you can find that motivation. Uh, Rosella, I see you got your hand up. Yeah, I will say I agree with you, Cecil. I'm like, there's, there's two parts for me. Like one, I try to find different angles a lot. Like I worked at an insurance tech company um, as a software engineer. That, that sounds hella boring. But like we had hackathons and that would be when we would come up with ideas of what else we could add to our product. And like one of my ideas was like adding a translation feature so that like people who didn't speak um, native, um, natively speak English could um, use the app. Like that type of stuff made me excited because I'm excited to help people. So like I always think of it that way, like, oh, I'm even though I'm not that interested in this, I'm excited to help someone like be able to use this because I just, I don't know. I just like helping people. And then on the like more, the less, the less like selfless side, I'm also pretty competitive and I want to be the best. So like I will, if there's some topic that I don't like, I'll be like, it's okay. Cause I'm trying to, I'm trying to be the best developer advocate. So even if this is like something boring or hard, I know it's going to make me improve as a developer advocate. Um, and I approached like software engineering, like the same way. Yeah, I love it. I love that competitive energy, man, 100%. Uh, James, I see you got your hand up. And then after James, um, Indra asked to speak. So after you, we're going to have him um, go ahead and ask his question. Cool. Uh, one thing I just realized is Roselle is the one who obviously cut Twitter space off because someone else was talking while she wanted to. So that's the first thing. Uh, second thing from a competitive nature, one of the things I like to talk about is completely opposite to most people's opinions on the topic. And it's the idea of comparing yourself to others. And most people 
for the right reasons, I think, say, don't compare yourself to others. And I've got a different take where I directly compare myself to others all the time. But I do that with my self-care in mind. I don't do it in a way that's going to discourage me. I do it in a way that's going to help me realize what's possible, things that I never thought were possible before. The specific example of that, I've always shouted out like Anya Kubo and the Coder Coder and Jesse from the Code Sacker channel. These are all YouTube channels that were growing a lot faster than me at a certain time. Actually, they're growing a lot faster than me right now too. But I watched them like grow really, really fast. And I was like, I've been doing this for longer. I haven't seen near the amount of growth that they have. What am I doing? And I got really defeated about that for a while. But then I started to have a little moment, momentum. And then I changed my goal and my perspective on that to look at like, okay, if they're able to get to this mark, I'm going to set that as my goal this year. And I'm going to look at what they're doing and then figure out how to help incorporate that into what I'm doing and achieve that growth. Never in my life would I have had a goal of reaching 100,000 subscribers on YouTube last year. Never would have thought about that had I not seen other people do it. So in that competitive nature, like I directly compare myself to people all the time. I do that in a way where I make sure that my self-care comes first and I don't use it as a negative, but it helps me envision things that I probably never thought were possible for myself. For sure. So Indra, why don't you go next and then Brian will have you go after he does. Yeah, sure. And just continuing to James' point here, I think what, what really matters is not, not, not the bottom line or your metrics that you're looking at at the end of the day. Um, I see many times there are clickbaits, quote unquote, that, uh, that the community would be pushing, right? Just for the sake of clicking, when you click and just go read the tweet or read the link, it's just some um, pushing the propaganda or something like that. What really matters is, are you pushing a meaningful content which can add somebody's purpose or which can help somebody as some, someone was uh, mentioning? Are you really helping someone? If you like that, then it's good to be a developer. Um, that's, that's the first, I would say, um, point to consider, whether you like to push meaningful content and whether you really like to help somebody rather than just getting your metrics or your followers or number of clicks. Um, that's, that's all secondary. It just comes when you add value to the community. Yeah, I agree with that for sure. Brian, do you want to jump in? You had a question? I, I definitely agree with Indra just shared there. Like it's something that tends to happen in this type of role of like, you know, you know, we talk about vanity metrics, getting caught up in that, and like, what are the trends on things? Like Rizal was talking about TikTok before, and it's you kind of don't want to get caught up in that because you're per you if you focus on your purpose of what why you're on the platform and stuff like that. Um, but my thing was more so uh, back to what James was saying. I wanted to ask him and anybody else that feel because like I feel like for me, I've struggled in the past with I've had moments where I've had that mentality of like, yes, let me I see these people that are doing really well, and that's like that's showing the the possibilities that I could potentially attain in my own way. Right. But, uh, but then there's times where I, I still find myself getting caught up in that comparison in a negative way. And so what, like, I feel like maybe there's stages to getting to that. So my question really is like, James, how did you get to that mentality <laughs> so that we can all learn to do the same? Because right now I feel like I'm still in this stage of like, I need to put my blinders on and just focus on me and how I can compete with myself. My, you know what I mean? Like and get better that way. Some of my personal confidence in a lot of different things where I am in my career just comes from experience. Um, and that's not an experience that you don't have. Like, I think we're at a pretty similar stage in our careers. But I, the reality of what I said is like, that's my motivational side of like what I want to communicate of how it can be good. The reality is like, I still struggle with that every day too. Like I'm going through a dip in YouTube personally. That's like, I just messaged my wife earlier. I'm like, I feel like I can't do anything right on YouTube. No video. Every video is doing worse than the video before. And it's like, like a terrible spot for me right now on YouTube specifically. So the reality is like, that's a really hard balance for me right now. I'm just feeling like, damn, I don't know what I'm not doing. I don't know what's wrong, but this really sucks. It makes me not want to do my next video. In some ways, it makes me want to do my next video even more because I want to have another chance to do better. So it's definitely a balance. I don't think that thing goes away. I think the, the thing to encourage people to practice, and this is a practice thing, is recognizing when you start to use that as negative and then maybe distance yourself from it. I don't think there's anything wrong with like recognizing that's not beneficial for you at this time and then backing away from it. And when you're in a more like positive mindset or you have other positive things going on, go ahead and capitalize on that and now start to look at like 
what else is possible from other people and start to internalize that and build on it when you have that level of positivity. But all the all the motivational things that I have, all the motivational things that I tell myself, they come in waves. But I do try really intentionally to continue to tell myself the positive things, especially when I'm really down. And I think that's a hard thing that a lot of people haven't. I think that's a lot of something that a lot of other people struggle more than I do because I just force myself to say it. It doesn't necessarily change things overnight, but I try to keep that keep that positive intention even when things start to get seeming super negative. Yeah, I think when it, when, when we think about like our careers and even our lives in general, like you said, like there's ebbs and flows, right? Like there's the good days and the bad days. And I think the struggle of what we need to try to do is try to figure out, well, how can we take that negative energy and turn it into positive energy, right? Like how can we take that, like that anxiety and turn it into motivation and be like, okay, well, my video didn't do this well this week. I'm going to try harder to do the next one. Or my teammates are writing more blog posts than me. Like, how can I like, you know, do something to, to, to show my value? Does that make sense? Right. But that's always a very hard thing to do. Um, let's go with, we're going to do tech rally next. And then Rizal, I see you got your hand up. I'll have you go in right after. Hey, uh, thanks for having me up. This is just a, I've been a software engineer for a bit now and it's pretty kind of straightforward in terms of what I need to get done and how I get evaluated. How, as a developer advocate, I know you guys were talking about like vanity metrics and all of those things. Like how important is that in terms of like getting raises or promotions and all of those things? Cause it sounds like that's a pretty difficult way to, and a lot of pressure for an individual to be responsible for because that there's like a level of like marketing and all of that stuff that is not really, um, I feel like you could hire people for that kind of aspects of it. Like, if you're just responsible for pure content and then someone else is responsible for somehow marketing, like I think that would make life a lot easier. But um, I'd be curious um, if that is also something that is measured against you. And if it is, like, how do you deal with that type of pressure? Yeah, Jay, I see you put your hand up. I'm guessing it's for that question. Do you want to go ahead and take a shot at answering it? Yeah, um, I, I think this also plays into a struggle where um, the answer is always, it depends. Um, and I'm so annoyed with that answer because anytime I have a question, the answer is always, well, it depends. It's like, no, it doesn't depend. Like there's an answer to it. Um, and my answer to this is determined by your company. Some companies will focus on your clout and some companies will focus on your effectiveness. Um, and I think you choosing where you want to work will be dependent on that. Now, obviously, the bottom line is what's going to matter at the end of the day. If, like, you're creating all this stuff and then, you know, we, we see it all the time. Advocate gets a big following. Advocate decides being an advocate for the company isn't as effective as going independent and doing the independent thing. Advocate leaves company and does the independent thing. Some companies want that. Some companies need that. They need a face to associate with their brand. Other companies are not here for that. So I think in terms of vanity metrics, I think there are always going to be metrics that make people get excited, make people get happy. Um, but at the end of the day, depending on the company that you work for, your metrics versus their metrics will always matter. Where I'm at now I'm not even thinking about what I'm doing personally because my personal brand has always been help one-on-one, -on -one. reach one, reach one. If I reach one, I can reach thousands. I just have to do it one at a time and they'll go out and do the same thing. But in terms of the content that I'm creating, I'm having to think about it from the perspective of if I reach one person on this, I'm going to lose my job. So let me start to think about how I reach more than one. And, and that means that the company can own that content. I don't need to own it. It's not my brand. It's not my style. So I think in terms of measuring your metrics, it's, it is going to depend on the company that you work for. Some will want you to just build your brand and do your thing. Some will say, honestly, if you're just another advocate on the team and the numbers keep going up for us, we don't really care what's happening in your world. 
uh, Rosal, I know you had your hand up for a long time. I didn't forget about you. So did you have something that you wanted to ask or jump in with? Um, it was, it was like the, the conversation passed. It was about the, the competition thing um, that Brian was asking about and how to keep a healthy mindset. I was only going to add that. I normally make my quote unquote competition be someone that I can, I know I can't reach that goal. Like, let's say I'm like, oh, I want to be like Angie Jones. She's light years ahead of me. I'm not going to be at that level, but I'm just like slowly trying to crawl up to that level, if that makes any sense. But I'd like us to go back to the the other conversation. So don't worry about me. <laughs> no, it's all good, man. Like, I just want to make sure everyone gets the, their moment to, to make whatever question and make whatever statement they need to make. Uh, DK, I see you got your hand up. Do you have a question or something you want to uh, talk about? Um, I do. So thank you guys for hosting this space. Um, I happened to just see it yesterday. Um, a little bit of background about me is I'm a brand new developer advocate. Like I literally hit a month yesterday. Um, I'm at a company. I'm the first developer advocate. So there's no program, no mentorship. Um, my boss is a product manager with no development background. Um, so with all that being said, I've spent a lot of time kind of understanding what they actually needed um, from a developer advocate and like what made them kind of look for one in the first place. Um, so now that I'm, they, I'm here where I'm like, okay, I have a place I know I can start at. Um, I'm currently like doing a lot of research, just kind of looking at other developer advocates and wanted to know, um, do you guys have, one, do you guys have mentors outside of your job. I know a lot of you are at bigger companies who have established programs. Um, so you may have like a mentor within your company. Um, but do you have mentors outside of, you know, or developer relation mentors outside of your op your job? And do you know of any like conferences or meetups for people like me who may be at like smaller companies with no program in existence? Result, you wanna you wanna jump in? Yeah, I would say if you haven't already, you should join the DevRel Collective Slack, um, because I do have a mentor outside of my job because I just wanted to see like what are other companies doing. Like I don't want to only be in like the GitHub DevRel mindset. Like if I go to a different company, I want to know how they're approaching things. So the reason why I mentioned the Slack is because they have a channel called mentorship. And I just like wrote in the Slack and I was like, hey, can anyone man mentor me? And people responded. So that's one suggestion. All right, uh, Jay, and then James, you want to go after that? Yeah, I mean, one, one of my mentors is, is hosting this call. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, and, and sometimes I think that there can be a unspoken mentorship of like, hey, I look at you as a mentor. I, I use the term like big bro, big sis, big that I'm like, um, that is, that has been helpful to me. And I, I think a lot of that has been looking at, I mean, we all, at, at some point we all want to be at the top, you know, principal advocate, you know, advocate manager, director, Deborah, like all of those things. But I think figuring out where you, you really want to enjoy your time or you really want to get into a spot. And, and you know, James mentioned looking to people that drive him to get to that point. I think in a way, like having those people be your mentors. Um, I, I'm open when I say like, you know, B. Dougie is a mentor to me. Like there's not a, at least a month that goes by where I don't just ping him and be like, hey, here's what I'm working on. Here's what I'm thinking about. Here are the things that I'm seeing in the industry. Here's how I feel about them. What say you? And luckily, the community is pretty dope. At least the community of, like, Black developer advocates that, that I know and that I affiliate with, it seems like everybody is pretty on board to helping one another, helping each other grow, helping each other get stronger. Um, that being said, I think that having someone that having someone that has a lot of your experiences uh, and, you know, the phrase lived experiences, and then someone that, that reminds you of you or where you want to be in the future is a great spot for a mentor. But even if they don't have time to set up, okay, let's do a monthly Zoom call. Like, just let them know, hey, I see what you're doing. I really want 
to like pick your brain sometime when you got a chance, but if not, just allow me to sit there and watch what you're doing and learn from that. But also leave that invitation open so that they can hopefully build that mentorship and build those relationships because you know you're just starting out it's it's going to get real fun um but it only gets fun if you have people there to help you keep it fun and make it fun yeah i agree with that 100 percent uh james you got your hand up yep i'll try to be quick um super reinforce the whole idea that like your mentor does not need to formally be a person. They don't even need to know that you're a mentor. I've got a million different mentors out there of people that I look up to, and I just pay attention to what they do. Like you said, you've already been doing. Oh, the first thing I meant to mention is congratulations on the new role, by the way. I saw you post about that, and I followed you on Twitter and YouTube, and I'm looking forward to your journey and content. Uh, but there's plenty of mentor opportunities out there. Don't think that it has to be that formal one-on-one -on -one meeting every X number of months or whatever, just like Jay said. Um, the second thing is never be afraid to ask, uh, be respectful of people's time, understand that like people don't necessarily have the time to do it all, but always ask and show appreciation. The last thing, I don't have any specific like conferences to recommend to you because I don't know enough about like your interest and in, uh, what's going to be beneficial to you and your company. But the thing I would say is just take advantage of the in-person time as best you can. Like I've been to a few conferences recently, especially after being at home during COVID for the last couple of years and being in person with those people that you look up to is literally game changing. Like I get so much inspiration from just talking to the people that are around me in person and just the conversations that we have, I'll walk away with so much inspiration. Like I said, so much excitement, so much uh, that I can, that I feel like I can bring back to my job on a daily basis. So absolutely just take advantage of those in-person opportunities when they come along. Yeah, for sure. A hundred percent agree with you too, James. Um, so, folks, thank you all for being here with us with this Twitter space. Um, I do apologize again for the that brief pause in the middle where we had a little bit of technical difficulties, but, you know, it wouldn't be the internet if stuff didn't happen. Um, I want to say a huge thanks to our panel. Um, I really feel like this conversation is getting super juicy right now, but we do have to you know, respect the time of everyone that's here and, you know, let them get back to their day jobs. Um, definitely want to recommend you all follow our panel on Twitter. Um, if you've not already, like, go ahead and click the head, the little handles and stuff like that. Make sure you follow them. Make sure you check out, like, the YouTube videos and their courses and some of the other cool things that they're doing. And um, and also, too, just before we leave, I'm just going to go around the room really quick and, and give each of our folks a chance to maybe promote and talk about some of the cool things that they're doing. So, Jay, why don't I start with you, and then uh, we'll just kind of go around. Yeah, so I just launched kind of a or relaunched a passion project of mine called diversity orgs that tech uh, think of it as a way for folks to connect with folks like them in their area in, in the tech space um it's still rough around the edges it's still in beta uh, i would love for people to try it out just search in your area search for the things you like uh as long as they're technically adjacent but hopefully you'll be following that story uh, as I talk about deploying that on Azure, which is, you know, how I, how I get paid. So, uh, yeah, uh, diversityorgs.tech is the site. Awesome. Rizal, you want to go next? Oh, dang. I was trying to think of something. Um... I, I say go follow at G Code House on Twitter. Um, that's an organization that I work with that teaches women of color and non-binary people of color to code. Um, and I've been involved in it for like over three years. So, yeah. Also, too, I want to recommend folks go and follow Rizal on Dev.2. She writes a ton of cool articles. She's not going to tell you, but I'm going to tell you. She writes a ton of dope stuff on, um, on Dev.2. Um, she wrote one just yesterday talking about some of her struggles as well as a developer advocate. So again, definitely make sure you go ahead and check that out. Uh, Brian Clark, my friend, you want to go next? I got nothing to really promote, man. I'm just happy to be here. Appreciate the conversation and, uh, and thanks. Maybe we can do another one sometime. <laughs> I love it, man. I love it. It's all good. Um, James, sir, you got anything you got? I know you got tons of stuff going on, man. What do you, what do you got? I'm going to start with a uh, plug in Brian's TikTok <laughs> since he didn't plug anything for himself. I don't know if you posted much recently, but uh, his TikTok stuff is fun. So go and follow him on TikTok. Um, I run a podcast called Compressed FM, uh, where my co host and I, Amy Dutton, talk about web development and design. So if you're interested in any of those things, go and check it out at compressed.fm. 
Awesome. And do I have anything to talk about? I don't think I do. Oh, please follow the Stripe Dev um, YouTube channel and also our Twitter handle if you haven't already. We are creating tons of cool and awesome videos around payments and things of that nature. Uh, but more importantly, I do think this conversation could go on a lot longer. So if folks are interested in us doing more and continuing this conversation and talking about like some of the things that developer advocates have to face and deal with, why don't you go ahead and give us a thumbs up. Let us know that you're still there. Let us know if you're still interested. And let us know if this may or may not be something that you want to you wanna talk about again in the future. But with that being said, um, I think we're pretty much done, right? So thank you again to our panel. Thank all of you that are here that have been listening to us. Really appreciate it. And uh, we'll see you again for another Stripe Dev Life. Bye, everybody. Bye.